I don't want to be here. And so I'm doing everything that I can to not have to come back here. The women's state prison population in this country has grown 834% since 1978, according to Prison Policy Initiative. More than half of all incarcerated women are mothers to children under the age of 18. Separation after incarceration leaves families severely impacted and children traumatized. But there are programs that allow women like Talea, Sarah, and Camilla to keep a connection with their children. My New Year's resolution is to stay sober and be a better mom to my kids. I would definitely say there's a few girls in the house I would consider family. I think for me the biggest scare is like what would have happened to my son. The National Council on Family Relations reports that the rise in incarceration has more to do with policy choices than a fluctuation in crime rates. But incarceration remains a tough-on-crime approach that is seen by many still as necessary to scare offenders out of their problems. Hi, can I help you? Yes, this is Sierra with the Minnesota Prison Doula Project. All right, come on through the gate. Thank you. Ramsey County Correctional Facility in St. Paul, Minnesota, houses women serving sentences of one year or less. Longer-term offenders are sent to the prison nearby. Can I just open it? Sure. sure. So they're going to start arriving in just a few minutes? Yeah, we'll have okay. to go get them. The Minnesota Prison Doula Project is about to begin its weekly parenting class. Hi, I'm Jisoo Talea. Nice to meet you. Talea is 30 years old, and this is her second time at Ramsey County. What is your New Year's resolution? My New Year's resolution is to stay sober and be a better mom to my kids. I got three, two girls and a boy. The oldest is nine, my middle child is eight, and my son is three. The project provides pregnancy and parenting support inside several correctional facilities in the state. We'll be discussing your return to life outside of prison in this session. We will also discuss your children and their needs and how to re-enter their lives in a way that can help them thrive. According to Sierra, one of the doulas with the project, Ramsey County is one of the few facilities in Minnesota to pay the project to do its work here. Being in here, you can't really do anything for your family the way you would like to. This class, obviously, has already benefited me a lot. I haven't been able to see my daughter in a year. I'm afraid that she's gonna forget about me because she's two. She was two and a half, and I don't know what to do because she's not doing too well. Like I talked to my daughter last night. This been going on for two weeks. I've been telling her I love her. She don't say it back. She just say okay. I mean, it hurt my feelings to the core last night, and I'm like, my baby don't love me no more. But I gotta realize I'm. I'm not the only one going through this. I'm putting them through stuff that they don't need to be going through. I was a, I am an alcoholic. I fell asleep behind the wheel. I hit the back of a car and I got arrested. This is temporary placement. No, but this is where I, where I sleep. I went through the women's way of 12 steps, which I'm currently doing again. We are on step four right now. I went through Boundaries Boot Camp. I did parenting. This class called Beyond Trauma. I made this. This is saying what my life looks like when I'm using and what my life looks like when I'm sober. Um, I was sober for 19 months and I relapsed in May. I got pulled over. This was your fifth DWI. Yeah. My mom gonna be like, you really sat on TV and told these people that? <laughs> And how long were you in here the last time? And I was here for six months. And I was hard. I missed my daughter's sixth birthday. I don't want to be here. And so I'm doing everything that I can to not have to come back here. Talea's sentence has restrictions around visitation and does not allow in-person visits without supervision. So far, she has only been able to see her children through video conference, which has become increasingly popular in correctional facilities because it saves money on staffing. The visit is for 20 minutes, and, and it's a clock on here that times it out. I've seen them Sunday, and my son was like, Mom, I want to come in there. But under the supervision of the doula project, she will have one hour with them tonight. These contact visits promote child-parent bonding, improve the child's mental health, and reduce recidivism rates. Basically, this card right here is your jailhouse ATM. 
Each minute is 21 cents a minute. And just wait till they answer <laughs> or call back until they do. Talia's mother is currently the caretaker of her three children. She is trying to reach her to make sure they're ready for their visit. But Talia can't reach her mom. You get to see what they got on, what their hair look like. I'm a, <laughs> I, I, I love doing my kids' hair. I want to see them and I want to be able to touch them and get them a hug. I ain't seen my kids in 57 days. Uh, I've been trying to contact my mom, but I can't, uh, she's not answering the phone. So if you could call my mom from Nayera phone. When did you start drinking? I was 13. My mom was a drug addict and she left us in the care of my grandma. I was sad I didn't, my mom was gone. I didn't, you know, when my mom comes, she just would come and sleep and leave. And I don't know, I just, that's what I turned to, drinking. Was incarceration kind of something that happened to people that you knew? Or it's to people my mom. that, so your mom was incarcerated. Hey son, hey girl. You had a good day at school? <laughs> All right, well, I'll see y'all in a minute. Okay, bye. bye. Hello. Hi, guys. Yeah, what's this? Just some drawings you did? I can't wait to see my mom. Oh my gosh. You're excited to see your mom again? What are you going to do when you see her? Hug her. Big, giant hug. It's a hug that says, that's mom. All right, come on, kids. Take your coats off. We can go see mom. All right. Okay. Have you guys ever seen one of these before? Yeah. Okay. There you be. Wow, no, we have coloring. Oh my gosh. Mom. She like this. Mom. Mom. Sir. Hey girl. Hey girl. Who did your hair? I can see your scalp. Uh, I really, you know what, Nayara? I really appreciate this because last night you had me feeling like you ain't love me no more. I was crying. And what? You, what? Yeah, you hurt my feelings. But I know it ain't nothing personal. You didn't trace that at all. I didn't you drew that by yourself. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Huh? Do you miss me? Huh? Do you miss me? <laughs> this is better than huh? seeing you on the screen. It is. Your hair is getting whiter. Huh? Mom, guess how old I am? Eight. Eight? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I missed your eighth birthday. I'm sorry. W, X, Y, and Z. Sing it. Sing it. Yellow. Little. Mom! <laughs> I mean, it's Uno. I got the red. Get this one. Get this one. <laughs> you asked to get your hair like that? Swap hands. Who you want to swap with? Um, it's going to be you. <laughs> we have. Ten more minutes before we're gonna walk downstairs. That went super fast, huh? Yeah, that uh, went fast. I know. Lord. I know. Seemed like I just came in here. I wanna, I wanna stay here. Yeah, I want you to stay here too, but you can't stay here. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We get our coats on, okay? Mama's gonna yeah. sit tight here, okay? I'll see you later. Bye, Mom. I'll call you. I'm gonna call y'all in a minute. You got your phone? Yes, my camera. All right.
he ain't no little boy no more. Yeah. I just didn't want to cry in front of them because I didn't want to make them sad. You know, but I just couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. You just set them an example that it's okay. <laughs> that you don't have to always hold it in. Thanks for It's okay. Thank you so much for bringing them. <laughs> Thank you so much. The parenting, I think, helps me because I wasn't really raised as a kid. Nobody taught me about domestic abuse, emotional abuse, um, verbal abuse. I wasn't taught the signs, or I wasn't taught this is not what you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, I learned that myself. After Talaya's release, she will go to a two-year treatment program. I just got accepted in DWI court yesterday, which I'm so grateful for. Oh, my God. When I'm drinking, I'm not thinking. I'm reading this book called Borderline Personality Disorder. If I would have went to inpatient treatment and got the real support that I needed as far as helping fight my mental, dis my mental disorders, I don't think I would be here right now. I'm just trying to work on me being better and doing what I gotta do to get back to my kids. And at the end of the day, we don't have control over the past, but what you do have control over is the future. So what you did back then, leave it there. I'm Sarah and I'm 36 years old. <laughs> I mean, prison's prison. There's nothing good about, about that at all. For me, it probably wasn't as bad of an experience as it would be for most people, and that's because I had a baby while I was there. You know, that's such a beautiful thing no matter where you are. No, you can't have that. <laughs> Sarah was sentenced to prison on possession of a forged instrument for counterfeit money, a felony. She was 19 weeks pregnant and raising twin daughters in upstate New York when she was sent to a maximum security prison. Because the prison had a nursery program, she was able to keep her newborn son with her. But Sarah lost custody of her seven-year-old twins. I'm really lucky that they were able to go with my parents. So they get to stay in the same routine and the same place and everything was, you know, consistent except for the fact your mom's not there, which I think is the biggest factor in a little girl's life. So how long were you in prison total? 11 months. 11 months. And how did you explain to your girls what happened to you? How much did you tell them? Um, I told them mommy made fake money and they said like Monopoly money and I said kind of but it looked more real than that. <laughs> and how did you finally get caught doing that? Same serial numbers I think is what got me. Right. And you were doing this with someone else? I was doing this with the father of my son, yeah. And the father of your son is currently where? He's in Syracuse. We don't speak. Are you allowed to speak? No. Uh, I have no interest in speaking with him. I have. Can you tell me what your childhood was like growing up in Syracuse? It was good. I was involved in dance. My mom owns her own dance company, so I took dance for years. I would play the piano. I was a cheerleader. I played softball sometimes. <laughs> Syracuse is a little bit boring. Once you get to a certain age, there's most people are just getting in trouble there or they're moving on and moving to different places. So I stayed there and I got bored with my life and got in with the wrong crowd and what are you doing? That was that and that's when I started hiding things from my family and so I, I would say that's probably my late teens is when things slowly started to go downhill. And when you say go downhill, what does that mean? Um, you know, using drugs. Sarah was released early from prison and into a transitional community called Our Children, along with her one-year-old son, Vincenzo. In our village, H-O-U-R village. Okay. <laughs> the community ran the nursery program at her prison and helps formerly imprisoned mothers build a life with their children with the goal of ending the cycle of intergenerational incarceration. From 2013 to 2018, less than 6% of the women in Our Children's programs returned to prison, versus a statewide average of 29%. Sarah will finish the remainder of her sentence here. So across the street here is where I live, actually. The mothers here live with their children in community apartments. This is where you have your family meal? Yeah, we have our family dinners over here. We all take turns cooking. We all do our own meals. Sometimes we cook together. And share household chores. This is our playground in the backyard. We have the main office. 
the after school program. They do a teen program. We have a re-entry program in this area. This is one of the Our Children Thrift Shores right here. And this is for people who are recently out and need clothes for like job interviews yes. and things like that. The mothers even share parenting responsibilities. One of the staff members has volunteered to take on the responsibilities until the mother gets out. Ours is a re-entry program, so it's helping the women get back into the workforce. Under the conditions of Sarah's work release, she must maintain her internship with the re-entry program. I'm the office assistant, so I manage the calendars. Okay. okay. Yes. I basically look over the participants and make sure they're getting the help that they needed to have a successful career at some point. And I schedule workshops, and I also do the payroll. Count the money to make sure it's worth 15, 16, 18. There's a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. <laughs> she also has to check in weekly at Edgecombe Correctional Facility until she is up for parole. They try to get you in and out of there, so that's a good thing, but I still hate being in there. You're on parole in just a few weeks, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. How has our children helped you? Our children's helped me in every way possible. And they helped me while I was in prison. Having parenting classes that helped me work through situations that could be difficult. And then of course they give you diapers, they give you everything, it's like clothes, everything. Okay, it's gonna be all right. And it's more than you would ever expect that people are gonna help you out with. It's just a lot of selfless people that probably have been in the same situation before and now they wanna give back. You're such a dramatic little boy. If you could kind of look back, is there something that you've learned from being in the situation that you were in? I think that if I would have always followed like what I thought and felt was right, instead of what, you know, maybe boyfriends in particular wanted, then I think that I would have been in a totally different situation now. Sarah's twins are now nine years old. Her parents bring them to Queens to visit every other month. I'm lucky I have like unlimited rights and visitation and whatnot, but I just legally am not the mom anymore. I mean, that's hard going from being a full-time mom to now being ripped away from my kids, so. And I know it was choices that I made that led me there, but you know, clearly when you're in a situation where you're doing the wrong things, you're not, you're not always thinking with a clear mind. And so I wasn't thinking when I'm doing these things, well, this could make me lose my kids, you know? And I mean, I wish that I would have thought more like that because I think it would have made me a little bit better of a mother. Mom? Here we go. Hey. Hi. Oh, hi. We're on our way to the ballet. I know. How was school? I got a root beer lollipop and a Hershey kiss for being so good. Oh. Hmm. Hi, Bye -bye. Hey, guys. <laughs> There's your sisters. Say hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I love you. Love you too. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trying to take them back by the summertime. I'm working with a social worker to try to learn how to discuss things with them and discuss them moving here. You know, make it a, a good thing for them and not push them or make them feel forced, but make them feel comfortable coming here. The day that you get your girls back, yes. how are you going to celebrate and what are you going to do? Oh my goodness. Um, Probably, <laughs> we'll probably have a girls' night. <laughs> this is something that we've always, always done. Like, since they were two years old, we would stay up really, really late. We'd play we for hours, and I am very competitive, so there is absolutely no letting them win. <laughs> and that's just gonna get them prepared for the competitive world out there. <laughs> and then um, we'll watch a movie until we fall asleep. So that's my favorite thing to do is girls' night. With Vincenzo. Um, no. Nah. <laughs> okay, okay. You can do something else that night. Okay. <laughs> Girls only. Good night, Moon. <laughs> In the great green room, there was a telephone. JJ. 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 Oh, brother. <laughs> My name is Camila, and I'm 23 years old. I think the biggest misconception is that you have to be a criminal to be in jail, like a misfit or a degenerate, or there gotta be something wrong with you. 
I was arrested doing things I wasn't supposed to do, but um, things that I felt like I needed to do, both for the purposes of like my relationship, but also for like financial reasons. Now I got a record, I'm a felon. Camilla was arrested in May 2016, when she was accused of conspiring to bring in contraband during a visit to her son's father who was serving his sentence at Rikers. The DA was really trying to stick it to me and the judge was really like, no, like she's in college, like she's in the nursing program. The dad is already in jail. Like, what are you gonna do? Put her in jail and then like make the kid an orphan? Like, what are you gonna do? Like, are you gonna give him up for adoption? Like, this wouldn't help. I was grateful for that. Yeah, booby. Tongue? Mm, brush that tongue again. Children with incarcerated parents are at a higher risk of developing physical and mental health problems. According to the Economic Policy Institute, they are more likely to drop out of school, become homeless, and suffer from PTSD. I came back so fast. All right, one more time. And so, I don't know who did the research, but somebody came up with Justice Home as the program. All right, wash your face off. The Women's Prison Association is the oldest advocacy group for criminal justice-involved women and their families in the United States. It offers a trauma-informed alternative to incarceration, or ATI, program called Justice Home, which allows female offenders to serve their sentences within their communities. In New York State, it can cost more than $110,000 a year to put a woman behind bars. Justice Home costs less than $20,000 per woman. Through this six-month program, Camilla was able to stay in school, remain in her home, and keep custody of her young son. Camilla's record was also sealed. Do you ever think, you know, what might have happened if you had gone to prison and you hadn't had Justice Home? I think for me, the biggest scare is like, what would have happened to my son? His father was already incarcerated at the time. And I think that, that that ultimately really would have killed me, like knowing that I took his only opportunity to have a parent. The guilt is what would have killed me the most. What's wrong? My butt. Wipe your own butt. <laughs> Bye, Bye, baby. Have a good day. He was with you that day. Yeah, he was. So a small part of me would be interested to know what, what he thinks of it. But like, I think a bigger part of me is scared to find out. Who were you visiting at the time? My son's father. And he was at Rikers? Yeah. I didn't even make it into seeing him. Like somebody came and showed me like a phone with my photo on it. And it was like, we were waiting for you. We knew you were coming today. And they were like screaming, like, tell us what you have. That's really what had Jason like confused and scared. Ultimately, they said like they had heard us discussing certain things over the phone and that they had basically like waited for me to get there. So they take us both into the bathroom and they're like, you know, let me search your stuff. And they locked me in the cage. And Jason was really young and we were like talking through the bar. I remember he was like really confused, but I just kept trying to like make it as normal as I could. They gave me like a deal. You want your sister to pick him up so he doesn't go to ACS. We'll let her pick him up, but you have to tell us X, Y, and Z. Thank you. Ready, God, please. I think that like talking about people that find their way into the injustice system, like they're some type of like degenerates, like they don't belong or like they're not good enough. Really sort of broken it down into different types of racism. The personal, you just automatically associate like, you got arrested, you're a criminal, something's wrong with you. Like you, like you don't even ask questions about the circumstances and things like that. Camilla is majoring in health services and counseling with one semester to go until graduation. She switched her major after Justice Home provided her with the help she needed. I met with like the main case manager and I basically like told her my whole life story. And after all of it, she was like, oh, that's where you're into like advocacy because no one ever advocated for you. And it was like phew, mind blown. I was just like, oh, and that's who helped me get into therapy. There's like so many layers to a person um, and all of the things that may have contributed to how they ended up being incarcerated in the first place. So it was, I don't want to call it innovative, but it was new for me to be treated like well um, throughout a program like that. And so I went through like a whole like deconstructing of my own childhood. I was being raped at like 13 by um, a family member of mine. And I was like, 
you know, I was coming to terms with like, yo, I probably need therapy. Like understanding so much more about like how my traumas have manifested themselves into like my day to day. The ACLU reports that 79% of women in prison have reported physical abuse and more than 60% have suffered past sexual abuse before incarceration. This, combined with a lack of resources, can translate into mental health problems, addiction, and self-medication. People don't choose their circumstances, and I think that we need to stop punishing people like they do. I think it's important to share my story, to, to talk about why rehabilitative measures are more successful than punitive measures. How was your day? And his father is not in the picture right now. Mm. You know, he's here from time to time. He didn't have a father. His father was killed by police when he was 14. And so now fast forward and you end up in jail. And now your son is without a father. And I'm like, blue, go. He just asked me randomly on the bus one day, like, mom, is dad in jail? When you're a kid, you think like, okay, police are good guys. They catch bad guys. Like, that's what happens. So like, where does that leave you if your father is in jail? Like, what does that mean? Like, is your dad a bad guy? Like, are you the bad guy's son? Like, where does that, you know, where does that put you? Perfect. We're three generations in, and it's still trickling down. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now, big W for the top. Studies show that this trauma does trickle down. Children of incarcerated parents are at greater risk of themselves being incarcerated, with the risk greatest for children of incarcerated mothers. A lot of the times you are a victim before you ever got a chance to be a criminal yourself. Nobody taught me about abuse. Because you're a criminal, like whatever your family goes through, like they deserve it too. I'm putting them through stuff that they don't need to be going through. Like you guys are all like throwaways. I made some really bad decisions, but a lot of people make mistakes. I feel like that's an important part of it. It's like the trauma that's passed generationally and you know how that really changes the child's life.